My deep appreciation of theater history was instilled in me by Tom Empey, a college mentor to me and hundreds of others. While teaching Greek theater terms, he would grab the fabric of his slacks and say, You see these pants? Euripides, Eumenides making light of content that could be considered rather dry and stuffy while still maintaining respect for the art, which is what I want to do with this podcast. For each episode, I invite a guest from the many paths my theater career has taken me down. I give my guest no idea what we'll be talking about, but they know we're going to find an outrageous story about theater history and perhaps get a better understanding about why we're still doing it after all these years. So welcome to Euripides Humanities, and I am your host, Aaron Odom. Apocalypse, apocalypse, I said, why you want to show up now? Just when the heart of my life was getting good. I'll give you one more chance. Walk on out of the door, yeah. Get your ass to getting where the getting is good. This podcast is sponsored by Podbean. Podbean is the easiest way to create your own podcast. We here at Euripides Humanities, we use Podbean. So download the free Podbean podcast app to start, record, and publish your very own episode in minutes. Podbean provides you everything you need to run your podcast, and you can record and publish episodes directly from the app on your phone. It even allows you to splice files together if you need to. It's really great. Download the free Podbean app today. That's P-O-D-B-E-A-N. Then head on over to Podbean at www.podbean.com and use the code PODCAST21, that's PODCAST21, for your first 30 days of podcast hosting for free. Check it out! And now, on to today's episode of Euripides Humanities, a theater history podcast. Welcome back, my friends and listeners. You are here for the second episode of Oscar Wilde. I'm here with my friend Dustin Hebert, who is the instructor. He's an instructor at Kelly Walsh High School in Casper, Wyoming. If you have not yet listened to episode 17, go back and check it out now. And we will see you here at episode 18 when you come back. But if you have listened to episode 17, here we go. So as you might recall... We have gone through the love life of Oscar Wilde and Lord Alfred Douglas, otherwise known as Bosey, and the exploits of Bosey's father, who wanted to squash all relationship between Bosey and Wilde, who were madly in love with each other at a time when it was punishable by imprisonment to right. be homosexual. Right? Absolutely. I got it all so far? Absolutely. Yes. And let's not forget that Oscar Wilde is a fantastic writer. Uh, yeah. And... Douglas is a dick. Uh, a little bit, a little bit. I mean, I think, th- I think uh, those those are your words. I'll let you have them. My <laughs> words. I think which, it's all, and this is all fantastic. Yeah. Which, oh my God, pale in comparison to Wilds. Whose whose words could be like Wilds? Not even Shakespeare. Oh goodness. So back to it. The importance of being earnest premiered on February fourteenth, eighteen ninety five. Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day. <laughs> we should do that unison. Douglas attempted to attend the premiere with a bouquet of rotten vegetables that he was going to present to Wild and had intended to disrupt the performance and berate Wild publicly. That's like a guy showing up to Hamilton hoping to cause a ruckus. <laughs> There's no like, way this will be good, you idiot. Like all the people afterwards who were like, hey, why were they so mean to Mike Pence? <laughs> you didn't watch the show, did you? I mean, you, you didn't get it, did you? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, good yeah, luck. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, here you go. Wilde had already gotten wind of Douglas's plot. Oh, and crafty had, bastard. And had this theater surrounded with police officers. Oh, Douglas is in trouble. Douglas tried to get in, but was turned around at each attempt and basically stomped around the theater for the next three hours, basically muttering to himself or yelling at the building. <laughs> Listen, first off, you've got to admire Douglas's like commitment to yep. commitment to being bitter. 
They'll come out eventually. Well, things took a lot longer. People had a whole lot more patience back in the late 1800s. And so that that's fine. Three hours to them was fine, right? We that didn't have to get back right. for Survivor, The Bachelor. No, absolutely not. They weren't being bombarded with multitude of text messages, Facebook notifications. <laughs> and so he really didn't have anything else to do at the time. I'm sure he was drunk while he was doing it. Because oh that's my God. what you do. Probably. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I would be. Yeah. So anyway, Douglas knew about Wilde's other regular haunts, though, as well. He knew that one of Wilde's favorite places was the Albemarle Club, where Wilde and Constance were members. And they had, like, you know, a restaurant, maybe a spa and stuff. Yeah. There, he left a card with the porter of the club, asking that it be handed directly to Wilde the next time he showed up. Two weeks later, when Wilde actually attended the club again, the porter handed the card to Wilde, who read the handwritten note from Douglas. To Oscar Wilde, posing as a somdomite. He meant to write sodomite, but was never all that good with spelling. What the... <laughs> what the hell, guy? <laughs> like, if you're going to do that, you've got a credibility to worry about. You really need to lock that down. Like, God, <laughs> ask somebody else. Did like, I spell that song to Mike, right? <laughs> ah, get another business card. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. So, uh, I put a dot above the key now. <laughs> Darn, Jesus. <laughs> Just useless in writing. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I'm, uh huh. I'm sure that I'm sure Oscar Wilde just really enjoyed that. Oh, well, for Wilde, this was the last straw. Okay, all right. Not knowing how many people, particularly strangers, may have seen that card, he sought legal action. Yeah, and and began the process of suing the Marquis of Queensbury for public defamation. Huh, huh, okay, okay. In, an, in a note he wrote to Bosey, Wilde stated, I don't see anything now but a criminal prosecution. My whole life seems ruined by this man. That's funny. Like, honestly. That's, yeah. yeah. It, like, honestly, yeah. the guy did come to the premiere of his most successful play and sit out there for hours just going, I'm pretty sure they're humping each other in there. I'm sure of it. Like, throws a rotten <laughs> tomato mean- every now and then. And I think I think that's like Oscar Wilde's got a right to do that at this point because <laughs> if he didn't take action against him, yeah, right, then people would question that. Yeah, because he's already Douglas has already made a public display. He's mm-hmm. already called him out with multiple witnesses. Yep. So Oscar Wilde, on one hand, is making sure that he's staying consistent mm-hmm. with the, uh, the the common procedures of the time. Yeah, if somebody yeah. talks crap on you. Uh, quote unquote, fake news is you, you yeah. are actually able to sue them. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you also have to consider this is a critical point in his career. Like I said, he oh, had you just- Oh, so you come out, okay. Yeah, yeah he's mm-hmm. like, uh, if I don't make something good of this, if I don't try to like sa- salvage something out of this, I'm done. I'm done. Not only, not only am I embarrassed publicly, but I lose my- Freedom. <laughs> and say, you can't say freedom like that. <laughs> yes, I, I, I lose my rights. Okay. Freedom? <laughs> I didn't have any rights anyway. All right. Now, during the next month or so, in preparation for the trial with his attorney, when asked if there was any truth to the accusations that he was a sodomite, Wilde called the accusations, quote, absolutely false and groundless. Then, once preparation for the trial was over, Wilde and Bosey took an extravagant vacation to the south of France. Yeah, that no, that, <laughs> that tracks. That completely tracks. Let me tell you why that tracks. <laughs> because when I get accused of homosexuality, I fight it tooth and nail. And then I take my closest male friend to Fire Island for a bit. A tryst, <laughs> not a tryst, a short amount of time. That track, there's, track. Abso- there's absolutely no uh, base for this argument whatsoever. Now, if you'll excuse me, my young boy Raimondo and I must go to an Elton John concert. <laughs> <laughs> While wearing a selection from 
Liberace's. Uh, <laughs> oh no! But remember, for those listeners that can't remember, we're doing Hugh Grant for this. Oh, yes. <laughs> my, my, Liberace. Liberace has given me a, a bit of a clothing wear. I, 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 I packed my sequin chaps. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And and Bozy was just a boy. Standing in front of a, standing in front of Oscar Wilde, <laughs> asking him to love her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, you want to take me with you? Well, I suppose. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, they returned about a week before the trial began, and Wilde was met by many of his friends. One being George Bernard Shaw. GBS is in yep. this. Shaw, ah. Shaw pleaded for Wilde to drop the suit and leave England, to exile to somewhere more tolerant of his lifestyle, like France. Okay, France would do it. Okay, yeah. And he'd been to France a few times. He wrote Salome there and almost got, right. he did get it performed there actually, like eventually. The trial began on April 3rd at the Central Criminal Court of England and Wales, also known as Old Bailey. Oof. Mm-hmm. Wilde was represented by prominent lawyer Sir Edward Clark, who only took the case based on the idea that none of Douglas's accusations were true, and he made Wilde swear to that. Uh Uh-oh. Mm-hmm. Now, do they have the, like, like the idea of perjury and things like that? I'm not that familiar. uh, Of the many things that I studied in college, uh, 19th century British law was not. Oh, really? Ever on that list. I mean, that, that was my advanced writing class. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, no 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 i mean like clark you know he was going to give him the best case possible right and wanted to make sure that hey i'm gonna put everything of myself into this and your defense but i gotta know but is any of this really true this is at the same time period where and, and let's be let's be clear like this is the same time period in american history where um, you've got the great expansion, you've got the westward mm-hmm. push, you've got mm-hmm. uh, right there an independent territory. The, the, the land rushes. Right, and, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, the land rushes. And when the guy kills Buffalo Bill and has the trial, and they're like, well, he says he didn't do it. <laughs> so he didn't do it. Like, that's the mm-hmm. judicial system of America. Uh-huh. I'm sure Britain had a way more stringent, more... Uh, Dare I say, evidence-based society? Mm. Well, they wore wigs. Oh. You got me there. You got me there. A complete deflation of, oh. of point. Oh, they've got wigs. Cool. Yeah. Well, they win. Douglas was represented by Edward Carson. Both lawyers were heavyweights, and each party was very well represented. To open, you'll love this. Clark read aloud from the letter that was found in Wood's hand-me-down suit from Bosey. He fucking Clark. The, no, 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 no. Clark, Wilde's lawyer, read this. He what? read the. Nah, check this out. It has actually been stated that Clark's opening statement, by some law critics or you know students of law, they said this may have been the most compelling opening statement I have ever seen. And Clark had other intentions in mind with reading this letter, even though it seemed incriminating. Quote, he reminded the court that Wilde was a poet and the letter should be read as, quote, the expression of true poetic feeling with no relation whatever to the hateful and repulsive suggestions put to it in the plea in this case, end quote. Because loving a man is fine but having sexual relationships with a man was the crime? Well, well, it wasn't, I mean, this, this, isn't, this isn't even love. He's just expressing himself poetically. Okay, so I mean, this, using this, the art of metaphor, similar uh-huh, structures yeah. like that, yeah. it can be interpreted as such. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. The, like we were saying earlier, you see two men on the street and somebody gets angry. It's like, those gay people make me sick. And right. when I think about what right. they do, in the, uh, that's what Clark is, is, really? is capitalizing on. He's going, He's ca- okay. you're putting the image in your head. He's capitalizing on the implication basis mm-hmm. of, mm-hmm. of Douglas's own imagination. Yep. Yep. Which I'm, I'm sure was very vivid. 
<laughs> Carson, who is uh, uh, Douglas's lawyer, Carson responded in his opening that he planned to call to the stand several young men who had participated in sexual acts with Wilde in the recent past. Okay. Okay. Gauntlet's thrown. Later that day, Wilde took the stand. While Clark was planning on using the letter to his advantage, knowing that Wilde could turn a phrase not just in print, but also in the spoken word, Wilde immediately cast himself in a poor light by blithely lying about his age, claiming to be 39 when he was actually 41. Vanity kills you. Uh, yep. Yeah. I mean, look, isn't that just kind of a catty move? How old are you? Yeah, it is. Yeah. 39. Oh, you can't. Thirty-nine. And you're always gonna say that with thirty-nine. Uh, thirty-nine. <laughs> <laughs> and then he turns to the jury and just raises his eyebrows. Yeah, eyebrow, eyebrow, eyebrow. And then well, and then the the, nice the, the fey man in the jury just bring a finger to the lip. Hmm. He continued by lavishly describing the many actions of libel and slander brought upon him by Douglas. However, to finish the day, Wilde was asked if there is any truth to the allegations whatsoever. His response, here we go, Hugh Grant. There is no truth whatever in them. Just Hmm. plain, no. Simple, simple. The second day started with cross-examination of Wilde from Carson. Carson brought up an account of a young man named Walter Granger, and Carson was asked if Wilde had kissed him or not. Wilde's response? Oh, oh dear, no. He was a particularly plain boy, a peculiarly plain boy. He was unfortunately extremely ugly, and I pitied him for it. Ooh, what a dick! <laughs> like, if someone insulted me like that, I'd be like, thank you. Wait, no, thank you. Like, that's... <laughs> But he said it really nice. Carson then asked if it was only because the boy was ugly that Wilde did not kiss him. Wilde's response? You sting me and insult me and try to unnerve me. And at times one says things flippantly when one ought to speak more seriously. Didn't answer the question. Uh, Slapped him across the face with a sweet sequin glove. I miss those times. (laughs) Because as a member of the jury, I would have been like, Oh, no, he's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he was just oh, playing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, you're, yeah, just, yeah. you're just trying to be mean. Yeah. You're just yeah. grouchy. Mm-hmm. And that boy, I, really, that boy really was ugly, though. He, it's him. really rough. Just, <laughs> ooh. Ooh. You can tell how many times his nose had been broken, or maybe it's just oh, more like that. Yeah. Horrible. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's got a penis like Douglas's. <laughs> Both lawyers closed their cases that afternoon, and Douglas was never called to the stand, nor were any of the young men that Carson touted in his opening. Okay. Okay. Well, that was it. That was it. This flippancy from Wild was starting to make the jury sour, and an acquittal was looking less and less likely. So so, So it was actually working against Wild. Well, I mean, he wasn't like like he I mean, said. I get it. Oh, oh, you should say. I'm sorry. Yes, I should say things more seriously. But it's just who I am. And they're like, "No, dickhead! Come on, this is like your yeah. life and death here. Come on." Yeah. Come on. Okay. All right. Yeah, so and, and so charmed. Yeah. So I mean, I can just I can just see Carson being like, "Uh, I rest my case." <laughs> yeah. Now that night. Clark, Wilde's lawyer, begged Wilde to drop the suit because if the jury sided against Wilde, just some of the implications it made in the trial could put Wilde back in the court defending the very thing Douglas was accusing him of being. Okay. So if the jury sided for Douglas, there was now right. somewhat kind of implications that Wilde might be gay. And there's precedents, uh, and then you got those court records yep. for a countersuit. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. I, I learned that word today just for uh-huh. this was counter <laughs> Damn, you weren't supposed to say that. Uh, <laughs> the next morning, it was announced that Wilde was dropping the libel suit altogether. Okay. So he listened to his lawyer. A not guilty verdict was the final decision by the court. Oh! 
But they had to say something because they had to record it. So they're like, well, what would you have voted? I guess not guilty. It doesn't matter. However, the wheels were already in motion. Quote, during the trial, Queensbury's attorneys had forwarded copies of statements by the young men scheduled to appear as witnesses to the director of public prosecutions, resulting in a warrant for Wilde's arrest on charges of sodomy and gross indecency the same day as Douglas's not guilty verdict was handed down. I'm reminded of that Shakespearean line from Julius Caesar, the fault your mm. Brutus is not within our stars, but within ourselves mm. that we are underlings. Mm. We create by our own arrogance, by our own hubris, we create mm. our own downfall. It seems like we've been saying this in theater for years. What a wild, no, he only wrote comedies. All right. <clears throat> <laughs> on April 26th, 1895, the case The Crown versus Oscar Wilde began with oh. Wilde being accused of gross indecency. And Wilde was not alone. A man named Alfred Taylor was charged along with Wilde for procuring young men for Wilde. Oh, he was his pimp. Okay. Uh huh. During this trial, many young men testified to having sexual relations with Wilde, but in the end, all claimed that they were deeply ashamed for what they had done. Well, yeah, because then mm -hmm. if they didn't show remorse, they could yeah. also be held accountable. They're Best sex themselves. I ever had. Okay, write down his name. <laughs> yes, but it wasn't very good. <laughs> he had good a smile. penis shape like, have we said this three times yet? All right. <laughs> Despite all this, Wild pleaded not guilty. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess. In this trial, yeah. okay, here we go. You you were talking about the writing power of Wilde earlier. I'm going to try to do this with my best. In this trial, particularly by the fourth day of testimony, when Wilde took the stand, Wilde had calmed down much of the flippancy that was present in his demeanor during the libel trial. Believing that he had a silver bullet, prosecutor Charles Gill focused on a line from a poem written by Bosey when he asked Wilde, what is the love that dare not speak its name? Wilde's response. The love that dare not speak its name in this century is such a great affection of an elder for a younger man as there was between David and Jonathan, such as Plato made the very basis of his philosophy and such as you find in the sonnets of Michelangelo and Shakespeare. It is that deep spiritual affection that is as pure as it is perfect. It dictates and pervades great works of art like those of Shakespeare and Michelangelo and those two letters of mine, such as they are. It is beautiful. It is fine. It is the noblest form of affection. There's nothing unnatural about it. It is intellectual, and it repeatedly exists between an older man and a younger man when the older man has intellect and the younger man has all the joy, hope, and glamour of life before him. That it should be so. The world does not understand. The world mocks it and sometimes puts one in the pillory for it. I'm very glad that you did not read that in the style of Hugh Grant. Me too. Because that was, it, he's right. Mm -hmm. And the older you and I get, mm -hmm. we get it. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the colloquialisms that, old men use to talk about the wisdom of the age and the vigilance of the youth was lost on me when I was 15, 16. Now at 40 and you're 42, mm -hmm. right? We look back and go, oh, you got to love that shit. <laughs> you know, they were not, trying not, to show me something. Listen, listen <laughs> this is not going to be as poetic as Oscar Wilde because nobody <laughs> could, but you look back and you go, God, that's just great. I just Ugh. this guy this guy just got broken up with yeah he thinks his life is over yeah and he's 16 <laughs> and he's crying and you just gotta love that shit because you're like oh, 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 oh boy <laughs> just but well every just, anything you don't understand the hurt oh hold oh. on to that saddle <laughs> oh, I, don't <laughs> I had one of my students who said, I guess I'll never have my happy ever after at 17. And I went, Oh God, uh, I can do nothing but yeah. love that 
because right. I love I love the you know as an actor and as a teacher you love the extremes of youth. You love how everything feels so important and it has to be this way. And then you're 40 going, fuck, you don't <laughs> know. <laughs> like, <laughs> but I miss that sometimes. Yeah. I miss yeah. that. Because you're sitting here going, well, I miss the extremes, the highs, the lows, mm -hmm. the pits, and the peaks. And it's yep. that is a very identifiable statement by Wild. And I can yep. completely understand why he'd say it. Yep. Not, notwithstanding the fact, mm -hmm. excellent defense. Notwithstanding <laughs> the fact, excellent yeah. defense. Yeah, yeah. But okay, uh, yeah, that that's good. Mm -hmm. That's solid. After three hours of deliberation, the jury could not come up with a verdict. Acquittal. Wild was then released on bail. Perfect. Three weeks later, Wild was back in Old Bailey. Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> this time around, the case from the crown tightened up and basically seemed like all they were doing was everything they could to deny Wild any defense whatsoever. Did they oh. do a hung jury thing? Did they do a hung jury at that moment in time or did they just delay the trial? Well, that's that's what the last one was. It was a hung jury. And so and and, and so they put Wild back in jail and he was and somebody bailed him out. Oh, okay. Again, not an update on British law. No, I that's okay. The that's British, okay. I, miss, I ditched out on the British yeah. law class. That's okay. That's okay. Theater kid. Now, in this third trial, the second one specifically about sodomy and gross indecency, only the most damning witnesses from the previous trial were kept, and the jury went into deliberation on the same day. Oof. Hours later, they came back and it found Wilde and Taylor guilty of most of the counts against them. Damn it. As the color drained from his face and over the shouts of shame that came down from the spectators, Wilde feebly called out, and I, may I say nothing, my lord. Wilde and Taylor were sentenced to two years hard labor in the prison known as Reading Bail. Uh -huh. Following the sentence, Constance took the two boys into exile in France and eventually Switzerland where she died in 1898. She had changed their surnames to Holland and Wild and Constance never divorced. See, that's, that's a love story. Oh, there's a lot to do there. Mm -hmm. And, and let's be, let's be clear. I don't mean, I mean, Constance created a bond with wild. That was, uh, I, I mean, there's a lot of things that are coming out now about this, but like this idea of, of, of an asexual bond, Right. This idea right. Of, of a partnership that's not necessarily devoid of sex, and we use sex so much to describe our relationships mm -hmm. with people. Mm -hmm. But you know your person when you know your person. Well, and, it's, and everything, and it's, I, I think Constance, she had every right to just bail. Well, I think it's a lot like you said in the last episode, that part of their life was done. Yeah. They, they had a great love. Right. And it worked for that time. And right. they didn't know that it was going to be finite. Right. And it was. Right. And yeah. they, they used it to their advantage as much as they could. Do you think Constance knew about, about I, th well, I think Bali, like, I think yes. Stallions. I think yes. I think she we did. Bring you Grand Back. Wait, if we bring Hugh Grant back, then we gotta bring Divine Brown back. So <laughs> <laughs> And does All that right, make and does that make Constance Liz Hurley now? Because that changes I, everything. I know. <laughs> but see, but see, here's the thing. I really liked. I liked the idea of Constance. I think she's a. She, mm -hmm. Oh God! I almost said a constant character. Uh, but she she is she is a north star of Wild. Yeah, she is always there. She is a. I I don't want to say the word constant. I I can't think mm -hmm. of a synonym for the word constant. She is a. A, a, a force that will always exist with Wilds, yep. with Wilds being, yep. and I think when we look, the problem is when we look at relationships, we always look at the physical, and we never focus on this idea of this romantic, altruistic bond that these people have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think. Well, I think that's that's one of the most beautiful love stories. Yeah, and, and I mean I, Romeo and Juliet's fine. I get it. They murder <laughs> each other. 
<laughs> fuck, a little bit really nutsy. But like Constance stood by him. She faced public scrutiny because of mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm reminded of that line from, oh, geez, this is nerdy. It's easy to die for another person. It's a whole lot harder to live for another person. Mm-hmm. That one. Deep Space Nine. Deep Space Nine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Walker, Texas Ranger. Texas Ranger. Uh, anyway. <laughs> I, I I can't remember. I saw it somewhere in my research, but I think she even visited him in prison a few times. Of course. Of course. And brought him some niceties every now and then. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But a doily he, here and there. Yeah, he's he's a, he's in a labor camp. You know. And and oh, this is awful. His job in the labor camp. So I can't remember the name of the material, but it's some kind of like goo that they have to produce uh, to slather in between the boards on a ship. So it, it, it becomes leak proof, right? Yeah, it's, it's like a tar, a, yeah, it's a yeah. tar mixed with plant residue. Yes. So what Wilde's job was, was to rip apart old rope, like oh. huge old boat rope to find those fibers that went into the, the goo. That was his job just for two ruined years. Ruined his hands. Mm-hmm. Just nothing. Yeah. yeah. Which, ironically enough, you know, let's think about that. He was a writer. Oh, wow. Yep. No dictaphones he then. He was a writer. Ooh. Yeah. Wilde left prison in 1897, but emerged a changed man. His health had deteriorated significantly, and his fervor that he showed for life had all but burnt out. He wrote a few things upon re-entering society, but nothing like he had written only a few years before. Finally, heeding the urging of his friends, he went into exile in France and died of meningitis on November 30th, 1900, at the age of 46, totally bankrupt. Jesus, that's such a sad story. Epilogue. With, With support from the Church of England and the House of Lords, the Sexual Offenses Act was passed in 1967, 1967, which allowed for men over the age of 21 to legally practice same-sex acts in private. Huh. And that is the story of the trials of Oscar Wilde. That's awesome. That's really cool. I have so wanted, like, I knew about it. I knew that he went to trial and it ruined his life. That's all I knew about it. And that and, is so cool. Ooh. Like touching in a way. I Yeah. Yeah. Like I remember finishing this and, and just going like, I don't know how this is gonna land. <laughs> I always really I always really liked Oscar Wilde's importance of being earnest for obvious reasons. Yeah, yeah, we have to read it. I get it. Yeah. And and it, it was and it was mm-hmm. very instrumental in the progress of theater for the time that it was written. I understand. But on a personal note. When we know that authors put themselves into their work, Ooh. we know this. Mm-hmm. We know authors put themselves into their work. Mm-hmm. And when we know that there is an identity crisis within the importance of being earnest. Oh, wow. Yeah. And Oscar Wilde had to do this identity thing. Yeah. And he had to balance both of these dichotomous lives that he had to live. Mm-hmm. It's so fantastic to see how Art reflects life. Yep. Yep. There's just no better way to put it. And that's just, he was it. Art and, reflects life. And as eloquently as you put that, one of my favorite things about that play is what is the invalid brother's name that Algernon goes to visit? Uh, 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 answer it for me. I can't remember. Bunbury. Okay. Bunbury. Bunbury. B U N. B U R Y, berry in the bun. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I got it. <laughs> no, I really got it. <laughs> and then when he says things like, there are lines in there like, you are positively a bunburyist, and I've always thought you were a bunburyist for the longest time. I am an accomplished bunburyist. And I go, you know, Maybe that's me. Maybe that's me being the dirty-minded freak at that point. No, we all are. We all we we all mm-hmm. lead into things far okay. too not not far too much, but we always 
we always read into innuendo. And innuendo, unfortunately, is one of those parts of our culture where you can easily blame the other person because you're like, well, there was nothing explicit. And anything that's implicit or implied, you are creating that implication. Right. The author right. is not. You have no proof that they are not, They are creating the implication. You right. are drawing the conclusion based on your personal experience, your mm-hmm. contextual viewpoints, mm-hmm. and that's what's happening. But that doesn't sound like anything else from history. Definitely no. not the witch trials or apartheid or no. the Ku Klux Klan Never. or yeah or you know no. the Trail of Tears. Doesn't sound like anything that has ever happened in history. Weird. Yeah. Well, that's the story of the trials of Oscar Wilde. I guess that'll never happen again. Never. <laughs> never. never. How do you how do you never. feel? How do you feel about all that? Well, first off, I want to read more Oscar. Oh, it makes me want to read more Oscar Wilde. And right? I shorted, right? I've shorted myself. I've shorted my own education in the lack of that. But mm-hmm. if, if you are familiar with theater artists, uh, if you're listening to this and you are familiar with them, there are so many out there. But oh. I, I have not. I, there are some loves that I've had and there are some pieces that I, I'm thrilled with. But that era is not one that I'm particularly moved by. Right. That that right. late eighteenth that late nineteenth century era is not one that particularly moves me. However, I have made a mistake. Well and I, I don't I don't know that you have, because I think in my personal opinion, Wilde was a standout. I think there was nobody else at that time writing like him. Structurally, structurally we move mm-hmm. from Russian theater mm-hmm. to American theater. Yeah. With some weird Structure. experimental stuff With, in the middle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Eugene O'Neill decides to like throw <laughs> the hairy ape in there and just see what happens, right? Yeah. So, so chronologically, we kind of ignore that little bit. Mm-hmm. And it makes a lot of sense too, because I've always been curious about London in the 1970s. I had made a reference to Hugh Grant in an earlier piece uh, in the 90, he played he played a bit of a poof, a bit of parliament. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. A bit of parliament. Well, that takes place in the 70s. Oh, okay. Ooh. And it makes sense now after that mm-hmm. law was passed mm-hmm. that, that, that 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 was character okay. that mm-hmm. character is revealed. Right. So I again, uh, we never live lives long enough to learn as much as we'd like to learn. Right. Right. And I wish and, I wish we did. And and it, I wish it, I was it, Dorian Gray. Well, and I think the crime here is that nobody went, well, okay, so he's gay, but he's given us this art that we yeah. appreciate and love, and now we're making it part of our canon. Right. But we have to punish him. Right. We still have to punish him. Rules are rules. <laughs> I mean, Order. nobody went, yeah, but can an amazing writer be something else? Yeah. Is it okay that he's the way he is? Yeah. Is it okay that doesn't that's, doesn't matter? That's what he is. There have been there have been so many crimes committed. I really have to make sure I say this exactly. <laughs> this is really no. Listen, yeah. I see no, a I lot of you. stupid stuff, but there have been so many crimes committed in the name of public decency. Oh my god! There You're have not been wrong. so many You're not wrong fallacies created in the idea of moralistic structure. And there have been so many hearts broken in mm-hmm. an attempt to be right. Mm-hmm. And it just breaks my heart. Yeah. Yeah. But again, real sad. Fortunately, none of that will ever happen again. <laughs> History will never repeat itself. <laughs> <laughs> well, it. on I that can't note, say this shit with a straight face. I'll just go ahead and say, Dustin Hebert, thank you for being my guest on this episode and both of these episodes. Brilliant. Oh, it was so wonderful to have your input into this. Just as deep and as humorous as an, I always expect you to be. So thank you. I hope I hope we can do this again sometime. This is great. Absolutely. Anytime. Awesome. It has been awesome. the highlight of my year. Woo! Wow. And it's only September. And for my listeners, this has been another episode of Euripides Humanities, a theater history podcast. Thank you for sticking around. We'll get back to you in another two weeks. And until then, I will see you at intermission. <laughs>